Uh, welcome back. Today we are looking at disorders of the stomach and uh, to be specific we'll be covering gastritis, peptic ulcer disease also termed as PUD, then cancer of the stomach as the disorders of the stomach and the duodenal. The first one we'll start with gastritis and we can broadly or we can broadly define it as inflammation of the gastric mucosa. And we need to know that this gastritis can either be acute or chronic. So if it's acute, it means it occurs within a few days. And if it's chronic, it means it's always recurring. It has recurring episodes. So if, it, if, if I have a type of inflammation of the gastric mucosa and it keeps on reoccurring, recurring, recurring, that becomes chronic gastritis. So what are the risk factors? What are the etiology? What are the things that might predispose one to? This type of disease one, we talk about food poisoning. Two, we talk about highly seasoned food. To be specific, it's only spiced, eh? spiced food. Spicy, 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 spicy food. Three, we talk about the use of NSAIDs, uh, such as uh, the kina diclofenac, uh, the use of brufen. And other. Then three, we talk about four, we talk about bile reflux, then excessive alcohol use, radiotherapy, stress, benign or malignant cancers of the stomach, or H. pylori, then pernicious anemia. Up to this point, I hope we are we are all well. Next, pathophysiology. Now, how does one develop this type of disease, which you've said is now there? inflammation of the gastric mucosa. So when we are uh, uh, predisposed or we are exposed to all these types of etiologies, be it the use of NSAIDs, be it excessive alcohol use, be it stress, now the gastric mucosa responds by becoming edematous and it becomes hyperemia and undergoes superficial erosion. Then we will always have scanty secretion of uh, the gastric juice, which always has little acid, but it becomes now mucus. So, as a result of the, all this, we'll have the superficial ulceration may occur, and to some point it might bleed. So, in chronic, there's always continued deterioration, atrophy, and loss of function of the parietal cells. Let's remember, for chronic, we say it's a type of gastritis that it always does the reoccurrence. Eh? It occurs again, it occurs again. So we'll have this aspect of uh, continued uh, deterioration and atrophy with loss of function of the parietal cells. So all this will always uh, bring about inadequate intrinsic factor. So this person will have inability to absorb vitamin B12. Next, we've talked about the two types of gastritis, which is acute and chronic. Now chronic appears in three forms. One, with superficial gastritis, superficial, so that's all about reddening edematous of mucosa with small erosion and hemorrhage, that is superficial. Two, with atrophic gastritis. Then three, with hypertrophic gastritis. So we need to know about the chronic gastritis and how it appears, the three forms. Now for just a recap of what we've been looking we want to know if you guys are par with us. One, it says, uh, name three forms of chronic gastritis. I hope you've answered. Two, it talks about vitamin B12 deficiency is associated with DASH anemia. I hope you can answer. Then, in gastritis, there is a hypersecretion of HCL or hyposecretion of HCL. I just want you to remember the pathophysiology that we've oh, discovered. Oh, oh. Next, what are the clinical manifestations? How will this person present uh, with this type of condition? Now, mainly for acute gastritis, we need to know uh, most of these clients will always present with abdominal discomfort. And to be specific, it's always epigastric tenderness. Two, some will present with headache, others will present with nausea, anorexia, 
vomiting and the and also hiccups can be there. But you need also to know that some patients are, can be asymptomatic. They have the inflammation, but they're not bringing out these symptoms that we ought to expect. Two, what about chronic gastritis? We we'll always have symptoms of vitamin B12 deficiency. Remember, it's chronic. It, it means it always it's occurring. It's coming and going. Then we'll have anorexia. We'll have heartburn after eating. We'll have belging. Then sour taste in the mouth, then nausea and vomiting. I hope you can now separate between the two clinical manifestations of acute and chronic gastritis. So assessment, what can we do so as to come up with a proper diagnosis of this condition? One, we can do endoscopy where uh, a camera is, is placed inside the GI, GI system eh? uh, and they are trying to visualize how the mucosa is. Then we can do upper GI X-ray series, which is the barium swallow. The patient swallows barium, then he or she is taken through the X-ray. Then H. pylori antigen or antibody serology. Let's remember when I talked about chronic gastritis, there is a point where we link C to H. pylori. Then we can look at stone examination of occult blood because we said there is that type when uh, the mucosa becomes that edema and to some point it might bleed. So we might have some aspect of occult, occult blood in the stream. Medical surgical management. Now how will we manage these patients that are brought in with this type of condition? One, we need to eliminate the cause. Let's remember the causes. We've looked at uh, various causes and we've said of uh, the use of NSAIDs, about excessive alcohol, we've talked about stress, food poisoning, highly seasoned food. So uh, eliminating the cause now becomes our first priority under medical surgical management. Then two, we give antiemetics. Of course, we've said this patient might present with vomiting, nausea. We give antiacids. Then we give uh, antiacids the way we just said. Then we also do treatment of established H. pylori. Now, let's say we've done our lab test. We've, we've done the test that we have said. And to be specific, it's this H. pylori antigen antibody serology. Then we found it's positive. So at this point, we ought to start the treatment with established H. pylori. So we use the triple therapy. Then we need also to do supportive therapy. This patient has pain. Of course, we have to do analgesics. We must give some sort of sedation. We, also, we are supposed also to give intravenous fluids because some will be having that nausea and vomiting. Probably they have lost a quite large amount of fluids of which they need to be uh, given. They need to be supplemented back. Then we also give vitamins with iron supplements. Then in case we've failed uh, with the medical management, that's when we do the surgical management, mainly to remove uh, gangrenous or perforated tissues and the surgical procedure that we do it's termed in here nursing management we as nurses what can we do well, we need to reduce anxiety we need to relieve pain we need to promote fluid balance remember this patient came with nausea and vomiting we need to promote optimal nutrition we need to avoid gi irritating feeds of which some we've talked in there are predisposing factors or even the etiology, then the patient may be in PO for hours or days, then it reduces ice chips followed by clear liquids, solids, foods, soon as to provide nutrition. Ideally we are trying to uh, we are trying we are trying to train the GI mucosa to come back to its uh, initial state. That's how we do all these other things. Then we can do A V therapy then we minimize irritation, further damage to the gastric mucosa. What are the possible complications of this type of condition? Well, we talk about bleeding, of course it might be there. Pernicious anemia, we say that the intrinsic factor so always misses. So will will the body is not able to reabsorb back vitamin B12. So this patient soon is at risk of developing this type of anemia, pernicious anemia. Kindly don't forget that. Then finally we can have gastric cancer when it's not when managed. That's about 
gastritis. Next, let's look at peptic ulcer disease. So peptic ulcer is always a break or ulceration in the protective mucosa lining of the lower esophagus, stomach, or duodenum. So ideally, when we try to define PUD, let's say it's a break, ulceration in the protective mucosal lining the lower esophagus, stomach, or duodenum. So we need to know that it can occur in various places like lower esophagus uh, in the stomach, each pyloric channel, or it can occur in the duodenum. So it's always key that at this point we need also to remember the anatomy that we've been learning all through. Actually, what are the risk factors? What might predispose one to uh, the break or the isolation of the protective mucosal lining of the lower esophagus, stomach, or duodenum? One talk about H. pylori, which causes two thirds of all the answers to medications that tries to alter gastric mucosa, such as the use of NSAIDs. Three, increased physical stress. This might be as a result of probably we having trauma, surgery, hepatic and biliary diseases. Then psychological stress, which commonly causes duodenal ulcers. Then smoking, then the use of alcohol, among other things. We need to remember about the etiology, but we need just to uh, have the key ones, H. pylori, medications to be specific, the use of NSAID, increased physical stress, psychological stress, smoking and alcohol. Those are the key things that might really pose one to peptic ulcer disease. What are the two types of this disease? With duodenal, then you have gastric. Duodenal is always the most common one. So just to make it simple, we want to do some sort of comparison between the two types of uh, the two types of peptic ulcer between duodenal and gastric ulcer. One, well, you can say for duodenal for duodenal uh, ulcer incidence age is always between 60, 30 to sixty years, eh? but for gastric it's always more than fifty years. So it means gastric ulcer mainly affects the world mainly, but duodenal from age 30 only is at risk of developing this. Then two, we have a hypersecretion of HCL, but for the gastric, there's always normal secretion of HCL. Three, for patients with duodenal ulcer, they may have weight gain, and for gastric ulcer, they might have weight loss. So we're having weight loss here. At this point, we're having weight gain. Then pain occurs two to three hours after meal. But this pain occurs one to two hours after a meal. Then, uh, these patients with duodenal ulcer, they're always awakened by pain, eh? mainly at night. But for gastric cancer, uh, pain rarely occurs at night. Then, for duodenal cancer, we need also to remember that pain is always relieved by ingestion of food, eh? that is for duodenal. But for gastric ulcer, uh, food ingestion does not help. Then vomiting is always uncommon with duodenal ulcer, but vomiting is always common with gastric ulcer. Then for hemorrhages are less likely to occur with duodenal ulcers, but for gastric CA, well, is at risk of developing this hemorrhage. Just a recap of uh, the comparison. What are the key differences? One, we need to remember about vomiting. It's always more common with gastric CA the way we've just looked at. We need to look ab about the pain. Pain is always relieved by ingestion of food for duodenal ulcer, unlike gastric ulcer. Then we need also to remember about weight gain. Weight gain, uh, we might have weight gain in duodenal ulcer, but for gastric, we have talked about weight loss. Pathophysiology, how does it occur? It's all, it's all about that aspect of histamine release, which occurs in the gastric mucosa. And this brings about now the erosion. That's all about gastric. Then, if 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 uh if if the gastric uh, mucosa is is not that much well, there's always higher risk of bacterial colonization of the ulcer, and this is what it makes it difficult to heal or to 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 yeah to heal mainly. Clinical manifestations: How will one present one? They will always present with pain. 
nausea vomiting, significant weight change. We need to remember there's that aspect of weight loss and there's that aspect of weight gain. You need to remember it occurs in each type. Then bleeding from the vessel that has erosion, then pyrosis, constipation with diarrhea due to diet and medication. Those are the key clinical manifestation assessment and diagnosis. How will we how will we assess this patient? How will we come up with the proper diagnosis? One, we need to do physical examination. And here we are targeting mainly pain, eh? and they will always be having epigastric tenderness. Or to some point, they may, be, they may also have abdominal distension. Let us, let us remember about uh, gastritis, the aspect of epigastric tenderness. Then we can do barium study. Then we can do endoscopy, which helps us to visualize uh, the GI system well. Eh? Then we can do stool for occult blood. Then we can do H. pylori test. So as to confirm if it's really H. pylori that is causing this. So what are, how can we now manage these types of clients? Now the main goal of uh, managing this type of clients, we want to try to eradicate this H. pylori and we are managing gastric acidity. So we are trying to eradicate H. pylori. At the same, same time, we are managing gastric acidity. So what are the methods that we can use? One, we go for pharmacotherapy, lifestyle changes, and surgery. If it's refractory, if it's not responding to the what we've done earlier. Pharmacotherapy. Ideally, we do combination of antibiotics, PPIs, and other things. We are trying to suppress or to some point we are trying to eradicate this which pylori. So what's the recommended therapy? We do for 10 to 14 days. So let's say triple therapy. We do two antibiotics, uh, metronidazole or amoxicillin and clarithromycin. Then we add the PPI, which can be meprazole, esomeprazole, or others. That's mainly for the pharmacotherapy, what you do. Other drugs that we can do, we can give antiacids just to uh, decrease the gastric acid and the acid context. Then we can do cytoprotective drugs. Eh? We are trying to protect the GI system. Eh? Then we can also do mesoprostol, which is a prostaglandin with protective and antisecretory effects of gastric mucosa. If all this does not go well, at this point we can go for surgical intervention which is time as gastrectomy. It's now the removal of major part of the stomach. So to that point, I hope we are well. Those are the surgical interventions that we might opt to do, depending with how the patient presents and also the location of the ulcer. What are the possible complications? One, we talk about hemorrhage, perforation of the ulcer. If, it, if the perforation occurs in the peritoneal cavity, then probably you might be having severe diffuse and abdominal pain. Then we might have pyloric obstruction. Then dumping syndrome might occur, where patients will always present with uh, epigastric fullness, then feeling of faintness, sweating mainly after meals. That's termed that dumping syndrome. So we can have a break. Free audio post-production by Alphonic.com.